This is message number 13 so far, but we have been at that we saw the high priority of godly leadership. If a church doesn't have the priority of that, um, the church goes by the wayside. Indeed, these messages have been challenging us to carefully look at who should be leading the church. And many of you have commented on this, that as we look at the call to pastors, we see the call to all Christians. And indeed, that should be what we see over and over again. And even as we look this morning, I believe that that will be the case. But one of the first things, the overarching idea is that a pastor should be above reproach. It does not mean that he is perfect, but it does mean that his reputation is a reputation of godliness, not a reputation of worldliness. The first thing that comes to your mind when you hear his name should not be sin, but the Savior. Look at the next one. Message number 10 was committed to faithful love. One of the first ways a pastor shows this type of commitment to God is his commitment to his wife. This means that he understands God's kind of committed love, a self-sacrificing love. And so it's natural that that shows up first in the list. This is God's kind of love. And then message 11 was um, committed to faithful fatherhood. Um, This, again, is a representation of his walk with God in the home. And uh, how can he, how can it, as we saw from 1 Timothy, how can a man manage the family of God if he cannot manage his own family? And so this is part of the picture that is there. Not perfect fathers, but fathers who manage their household well. Message number 12, we began last week, and we looked at part one. Notice the sermon title up on the screen in front of you, and let's read it out loud together, and you can feel a little Shakespearean if you want to be, Um, but notice here, let's read it. It says, to be or not to be pastoral qualifications. So part one, we looked at the fact that he is God's steward, that this is an important part of that. And then we saw some things that he's not to be. So have your outline there. And notice under the review, number one, fill this in, especially if you're new to us this morning. This will make the whole thing make sense. The Apostle Paul writes to Titus about how to lead the wayward churches of Crete, they had churches with a lot of trouble, to establish three things, right doctrine, right leaders, and right living. Just fill in the word leaders there. Right doctrine, right leaders, and right living. living. We've been focusing on leaders. Number two, Paul instructs Timothy to appoint godly elders or pastors or overseers in the churches. Now, this is real important. No matter what background you come from, whether um, Catholic or Baptist or Presbyterian or whatever it may be, we need to see what the Bible, the terms the Bible uses for what we in Baptist churches call pastors. Um, Notice here with me, there is no difference between a pastor and an elder according to the Scripture. Um, These these terms are used synonymously. Um, They are the same thing. So when you hear elder, um, really the idea here is a pastor. Um, The different verses from 1 Peter to Titus to Timothy And then in other places in the book of Acts and uh, others as well, it shows these are synonymous terms, just so it's clear. So if I say elder, I'm talking about a pastor. Um, Number three, worldly leaders do something. What do worldly leaders do? We said last week. Who remembers? Okay, I heard it back here from, I think, Daniel Simu. Sounded like him. I'm not sure. Worldly leaders wreck the church. Fill that in. Worldly leaders wreck the church. Now, they may do it slowly, or they may do it rapidly. But if you have a worldly leader, someone who is fleshly and not thinking and not not focusing upon the truths of God's Word, slowly but surely the church will be wrecked, or suddenly the church will be wrecked. But when we get away from God's Word, When we look to worldly leaders who maybe are smart or bright or persuasive or manipulative or whatever it is, very powerful leaders sometimes, um, they, over a period of time, will wreck the church or suddenly. But biblical leaders, when we pay attention to what God's Word says, biblical leaders will build the church. Very good. I heard somebody say it. Will build the church. So this is a great joy to see that God has a plan. 
Um, and it also shows us that we need to pay very careful attention to this because we see all around us in our culture, as cultural Christianity continues to fade away, we see that churches that are not healthy are also fading away. Heard about another one this week um, here in South Florida um, that is simply fading away very tragically, very sadly. It used to be a vibrant church, but over a period of time, the gospel ceased to be preached, and as a result of that, the church is simply fading away. So look at number four. Fill in number four. A pastor is an accountable manager of God's household. An account, a pastor is an accountable manager of God's household. And we see it in verse 7, and look at the box there on the page in front of you. In verse 7, he's called God's steward. And so that as God's steward, he is to be one of these. Remember, we looked last week at that this is not like a flight attendant type steward. This is not like somebody on a cruise ship that brings you um, something to eat in the dining hall. No, this is talking about a manager who is going to be held account, and he's very, very aware of that. We looked last week at the five not-to-bes, and so we're going to go back and we're going to read the passage um, in the box on the top of the page, um, verses 5 through 9, and you will see the not-to-bes as we come to that. But look with me in, in chapter 1 and verse 5. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order, encircle these words, and appoint elders, or appoint pastors, in every town as I directed you. Verse 6, if anyone is, what does it say? Above reproach. Just talked about that. The husband of one wife, literally a one-woman man. And his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. So he manages his family well. Verse 7. For an overseer, and here it is, as God's steward, and here's the things that he must, that he must be, is above reproach, but he must not be, let's say these five out loud together. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent, or greedy for gain. Verse 8 is where we are this morning. Here's the things that he is to be, the things that he should be, the things that he must be if he's a pastor. He must be hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. Verse 9. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So this morning we come to the six two B's of the pastor or of the elder, and the first one we see here is that he is to be hospitable. It's very interesting when you just see the word hospitable, what, what part, what, what's the first part of, the, you, of that word that you see there? What does it make you think of? Hospital, hospital right? Um, can you imagine a hospitable, uh, excuse me, a hospital um, that isn't very hospitable? You say, well, nothing about a hospital is hospitable to me. Well, let me tell you, if you're sick and they have medicine and they have people who know how to take care of your illness, it, that's pretty hospitable, right? And you say, well, I don't get very much sleep when I'm in there. No, it's because they're saving your life. They're, they're, they're trying to make sure that you make it. You can get, you can get sleep when you get back home. Um, some of those, they're not so very good. They want to sure, make sure you're still breathing through the night. They want to make sure that you're still there. You're, nothing's changed. And so in a, way, in a very critical way, they're very hospitable in that they're trying to take care of you. They're taking care of you. And you see, that's, that's part of the picture of being hospitable. And this is a beautiful concept that we see throughout the Scripture. But notice with me, this means helpful. This means nurturing. This means welcoming. Now, very often we only think of welcoming in this. But we need to be careful to recognize that it's more than merely being a nice greeter. It's more than being merely um, on the surface or in a very light way helpful. It's, it's, it's a much deeper picture than that. 
And we see where we even get our word of hospitable with that. Now, part of this is we see a Greek word that is here is philoxenos, and philo has to do with affection or a friendly affection, a brotherly affection, and xenos has to do with strangers. So that's interesting. So hospitable is the idea of you, you love strangers, you love those who you do not even know. What if you showed up at Memorial Hospital and they said, nope, we don't know you, go away. Wow, well, see, they, they, they have to minister to everyone. And so they're, they're, they're seeking to care for everyone in this. And here's part of the picture here, that the word stranger is in here. The foreigner is in here. The one that you do not know is in here. Just the opposite of philoxenos is xenophobic. Isn't that interesting? And that has to do with being afraid of strangers. That has to do with not being friendly to strangers, but being afraid of strangers. Let me tell you that that is, that is not the picture that God, we, quite honestly, um, in, because of our fallen world, unfortunately, one of the tacks that we have taken in our parenting is to teach our children to be afraid of strangers. I want to encourage you that we must be highly protective because we live in an extremely, exceedingly evil and warped society. There is no question of that. We see that around us every single day. Parents must be very vigilant in many, many different ways in this way. But we must not teach our children to dislike and to hate people that they do not know. You see, that is not the heart of Christ. That is not the heart of God. In fact, we would do well to look at the idea of hospitable, and we would do well to recognize that there are people that we do not know that need our help. I hadn't planned on sharing this, but this illustration is so powerful to me, I must. Um, our daughter, Cheryl Ann, married Nico um, Pliego. Um, <laughs> what did I say? Oh, who's laughing so hard? You guys be nice. For those of you who don't know, Cheryl Ann did not marry Nico. Her sister, Andrea, married Nico. Um, so, um, sorry about that. Our daughter, Andrea, married Nico Pliego. And um, in the midst of all of the, at the same time of the hurricanes and everything else, Andrea was here visiting um, from California and so we were running around trying to get some of her documentation changed, so her name. And for those of you who have Latino name structures, it, the last name and all of that, it's very confusing for me and for those of us that are traditional Americanos. So um, we were trying to get it, so her last name was truly Pliego, not Pliego Gomez, his mother's last name. So um, we we're having to work through all of that. And in the process of that, we went to one agency. They said, no, we won't do it. We don't like your documentation. Went to another agency. They said, no, we won't do it. We don't like your documentation. So we went to another agency, and they said, sure, no problem. But we close in 15 minutes. <laughs> and so we're like, oh, we can get this done. It'll cost $4,000 in California. We can do it here for 50 bucks. Great. And so we start going through it. And as I start to realize, they don't take a credit card. And it's 4.45, and we're down in the Keys when this was happening. We were down doing hurricane assessment, and the license agency had just opened. So there I am, and the lady just said, you have 50 bucks, right? And I'm like, mm -hmm. and I thought, if she just start the paperwork, that'll get it going, then she'll be more committed to wait and help us or whatever. So anyways, so we're sitting there trying to work through it, and some other guys had walked in from some last-minute business. They've already locked the door at this point, and there's two guys that are standing there next to us. And I realized I do not have cash, and this lady is not going to finish this paperwork if I don't pay them. And so I look over there, and there's two guys that were obviously Latino guys. And I just went up to one of them, me, the gringo, going up to them, and I'm like, um, excuse me, we're, we're really down to the wire here. My daughter's got to go back to California, and do, could I borrow 50 bucks? <laughs> For 15 minutes, for 15 minutes, I'll go and I'll get, and the guy 
as I'm talking, he reaches in his wallet, and I'm explaining everything, and he said, no English, no English. <laughs> as he took out a $50 bill, and he handed it to me. That was very instructive to me. He didn't even know what I was saying. <laughs> and he reached in. He was dirty from head to toe. He'd be, he was a contractor of some sort down there working after the hurricane. And he was from Mexico. And eventually, Andrea and I were able to express to them, she married a Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> but they didn't know that. They just saw this guy that urgently needed help, and without hesitating, without asking questions, without anything, he reached in his wallet and offered $50. Now, friends, this is part of the picture of what we see here is that instead of being afraid of strangers, instead of, instead of being um, inhospitable, to those who we do not know, a pastor needs to be the kind of guy that he cares for people and that his, his life, not just his home, but his life is open to those whom he does not know. Now, let's be very careful to say and to fill in here, keep in mind that all these qualifications are God's design for fill it in the normal Christian. You see, this is why a study on who should be a pastor matters to Carlos Molina, and this is why it matters to Chuck and Kathleen Samarius. This is why it matters to everybody in the room, because we're seeing an in-depth rehearsal of what is a Christian. And so we are all called, you know, pastor's called to be hospitable, not me. Oh, Really? Well, let's think about that just a little bit. Look with me. Notice Romans chapter 12. Notice 1 Peter. And notice Hebrews. Let's look and see. Is that true? Is just the pastor needs to be hospitable? No. Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 13, is written to all of the people who were Christians in Rome. And for us, you see, this is directed to all Christians. Fill that in. Let's look at Romans chapter 12, and verse 9 through 13. It's on the screen in front of you. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with what? Brotherly affection. That Philo, that Philadelphia, the, this picture of a, of a loving affection. Outdo one another in showing what? Honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Notice what it says in verse 12. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. And then in verse 13, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to what? Show hospitality. This is, this is for all Christians. Notice 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. It says, the end of all things is at hand, therefore be self-controlled, sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Verse 8, above all Keep loving one another earnestly. Sounds very much like Romans 12. Keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Read it out loud together with me. Verse 9. Show hospitality to one another. Now, how many times did you hear someone in your house go, well, we're having them over, but as soon as they've eaten, they're going? Or... You know, you're there, yeah, we're doing all this, and, it, and, and it's just kind of obligation, you know, it's, you know, relatives from New York or relatives from South America or relatives from Argentina, you know, whatever it is. They're, they're coming from out of town, and you, you just kind of, for some of you, it's not been a glad thing to see hospitality, it's been kind of a mad thing. And so, the, verse 9 is saying, no, 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 show hospitality without grumbling. And this even means in the context of the church, take care of one another in the church without grumbling, without counting the cost, without, without being so reluctant to do it. In fact, that even goes with God's call for us to be a giver. And what kind of giver? 
not a begrudging giver, but say it out loud, a, for God loves a cheerful giver. Um, you see, you can give, you can host, you can do other things, but if you do it begrudgingly, if you do it grumblingly, you are missing the blessing. Look at verse 10. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. You see, we're all stewards. It's not just the pastor that's a steward. Verse 11, whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God, whoever serves, he goes on to, to show a deeper picture of when you're saying things, speak what God says, when you're serving, serving God's strength. Look at Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13 also shows this is for all Christians. Let brotherly love do what? Continue. See, all these are about loving one another. Verse 2, read it out loud together. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Now, that was very weak. Not all of you were there. Let's do verse 2. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. What does that mean? For those of you who are new to us, what, what, what the statement is here is that there are some who've shown hospitality to people who are strangers, and here's the beautiful picture. They were actually angels in the flesh, and the people didn't even know that they were being tested. They didn't even know what was really happening. That passage has made me turn around before. That passage, when the Lord speaks in my heart about something, has made me say, man, I feel like God's leading me to love this person. I don't know why, I don't know how, but Lord, okay, if that's what you want. And, you know, we need to be careful um, to do that. Look at verse 3. Remember those who are in prison as those in prison with them. He's saying, remember those in prison as if you're there. And those who are mistreated since you are also in the body, you, you also have struggles. Look at verse 4. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Is this just for pastors? No, this is for Christians. Verse 5. Keep your life free from the love of money, and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, you see, these lists sound similar to verse 7 and verse 6. Don't do these things, but do these things. And this isn't just for pastors. It's for all. So fill it in at the bottom. These characteristics should be normal for all, or for all Christians. But they are mandatory for elders. So... These should be normal for everybody in the room who claims Christ. But let me tell you that nobody should be an elder who doesn't have these. So that's a little bit of a difference in that you cannot have an elder that does not understand and inculcate these things into his life. Number two, on the back side, number two, not only hospitable, but look up there in verse eight, it says hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. So here we come to number two, a lover of good. You see, this is a friend of virtue. The pastor has to be one who loves the things that are virtuous and the things that are inherently commendable. That means good. In their very essence, they are good. They don't, they don't have anything that's bad about them. There are some principles and truths, and there are some actions in our, in our world that God has given to us that are inherently commendable because they are like Him, and He is inherently commendable. Inherent in who God is is goodness, and it can be commended to others. It can be recommended to others. It can be offered to others. And so a pastor needs to be one who loves that which is good and virtuous. Consider the alternative. The alternative to this is those who gravitate not to good but to evil, and they actually love darkness. 
That must not be a pastor. It doesn't matter how much he masks it on the outside, but if he gravitates to that which is wicked instead of that which is good, it doesn't matter how eloquent he is. What is so important is that this is a man who's a lover of that which is good. And again, in John chapter 3 and verse 16 through 19, we see that this isn't just about pastors, though we see the issue um, very clearly. And notice with me what the big difference is. The big difference is, do you know God? And we see this, in, look at verse 16. You know this one by heart, many of you do. John 3 and verse 16 says, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the gospel. This is the great news, that God loves us so much that he gives his son that if you believe in him, you do not have to go to hell and pay for your sins. He has paid for your sins, and you can have eternal life. Look at verse 17. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. You see, Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world because the world was already condemned in its sin. And so when Jesus comes into the world, he's coming into the world to save his children. He's coming into the world to redeem his people. And so notice this with me in verse 19. And this is the judgment that light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. And so Jesus is saying to us and he's showing us the very thing that is about to happen in his own life when he is nailed to a cross, that we heard the truth, we saw the truth before our very eyes, and we nailed the truth to a cross. You see, we need a Savior. We need a Savior that we, that redeems us out of all of our depravity and out of all of our rejection of God. Look at Psalm 52 and verse 3. In Psalm 52, the psalmist writes, you love evil more than good, falsehood more than speaking what is right. That must not be a pastor. And in fact, John 3 is showing us that that cannot be a Christian. Now, the exact opposite of that is found in Philippians 4, 8. Again, a passage that for many is familiar. I want you to get ready to do a couple of things. Number one, look at Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8. It says, finally, brothers. So who is he speaking to here? He's speaking to the church. He's speaking to Christians. Circle the word brothers. You see, he's not talking about lost people, but those who know Christ, this is what they're supposed to think about. This is what they're supposed to dwell on. So finally, brothers, whatever is, underline it, true. You see, God is all about truth. Whatever is honorable, God is all about honor. Whatever is just, this is, this is having to do with right, which is true, right. Whatever is pure, underline each one of these, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, underline commendable. If there is any excellence, because God is excellent, if there is anything worthy of praise, because God is worthy of praise, look, notice what it says, think about these things. Now, what is interesting is the word for think about is it's not just like we think about things, you know, in, a, in the American vernacular. We, we're kind of like, well, think about that. No, the idea is um, that you would logically process and that you would meditate on it, that you would think through. I, I, I would, if I was translating this, I would, in, from Greek into English, I would put think through these things thoroughly think about them, and then, about this, interpret the world around you based upon these things. Evaluate the world around you based upon these things, which is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, 
and worthy of praise. Just evaluate movies, evaluate attitudes, evaluate policies, evaluate politicians, evaluate, I mean, all of these things. You say, well, there's no hope then. I agree. But the, other than crying out to God for them. But we, we look at this and we say, we must evaluate the world through that which is right and good. We must love that. Now, let me tell you that Hollywood is all about you becoming a lover of evil instead of a lover of good. What was Desperate Housewives all about? I hope you don't know. But if you don't know, you know what it was about? From near I could tell and everything I read about it and I never saw it, I saw five minutes here and three minutes there or something like that. Near about I could tell, it was all about adultery. I mean, it was just about adultery. It, it was about loving the things of the world and loving yourself and about the exaltation of self. You know, so storylines come in either with humor or with drama or trendiness or coolness or whatever, and then we've gone into this whole craze of reality TV. Are they, I mean, you know, there's a couple of shows that maybe occasionally exalt and celebrate righteousness, but usually it's about a cat fight. Usually it's about who lied and who did somebody wrong and all of the foolishness, all the lowliness of sin. If you feed your mind on the tube that comes out of Hollywood and Europe and everything else, if you feed, in South America, you feed your mind on those things as opposed to feeding your mind on the truths of God's Word, you will love evil more than you love good. You cannot love both. And so, for the Christian, we should love evil. I mean, excuse me, we should love, Chris, we should love good. Thank you, Lord. I didn't let that go. For the Christian, we should love good. And the pastor must love good. It's mandatory. He must love good. I understand that there's Christians that come along and they haven't yet figured this out and they're early in the sanctification process or maybe the Lord is starting to do something in them. And, you know, they, they still gravitate to the wicked. They still gravitate to the violent. They still gravitate to the sensual. And there, there hasn't yet some, been something that came along that says, I hate that. And maybe if you haven't come to the place where you've started to say, I hate that. I hate that because it's against God. It's against all that he says is holy and right. Maybe you need to pray like the psalmist, Lord, help me to hate evil. That is a prayer that God will be glad to answer in your life. If you will ask God to help you hate evil, if you will ask God to help you hate sin, he will help you learn to hate it. You, you can just confess to him, Lord, sometimes I don't hate evil. In fact, I, sometimes I prefer to hear stories of evil over stories of love and truth and holiness. Confess that to God as sin and ask for his help. God loves to answer those kinds of prayers of his children. When I went overseas to Czechoslovakia, when I was 19 years old, at the end of the summer, we were all talking on our team about what God had done in our hearts and lives. And I'll never forget, a young lady named Debbie Mossman sat at the end of the tent. We were all sitting there in the midst of a rainstorm. And we were talking about what God had done through the months of smuggling Bibles into Czechoslovakia. We'd worked in a pretty intense mission. It had been hard work, seven of us. And Debbie read in her journal how she had prayed at the beginning of the summer. She said, Lord, I've realized that I don't hate my sin. I've become very comfortable with my sin. And my heart is hard about my sin. And Lord, I pray that you would help me to hate my sin. And that you would help me to love what you say is right. And with tears that night, she read the end of her journal entry of just saying, God has brought tears to my heart over the ways that I have sinned against him. And he has brought renewal to my heart and my love for his righteousness. May we be lovers of good. A pastor must be a lover of good. Number three, a pastor must be self-controlled. He must be self-controlled. It's very interesting, the word self-controlled. Sozo, fran, is, those are the two roots that it comes from. It's a, one of the Greek double words. Sozo means to save. To save, and friend, is the word for mind. 
Um, so to save your mind. Now here's the idea. Don't lose your mind. A pastor doesn't lose his mind. How many times have you heard somebody say, man, the guy just lost it? You ever heard that say? Think about that expression. You're making me lose my mind. Or you, you see this guy, and he's, he's just going off, a woman or a man and everything, and they just say, he lost his mind. Well, here's, here's part of the idea. A, a pastor can't be one of those people that just loses his mind. In fact, Christians are not supposed to be the people who just lose their minds. You see, feel, notice this and fill it in. Emotional, emotional feelings may rise up, but rational thinking maintains control. Rational thinking maintains control. Now, put out there to the side, this can only happen through the power of the Holy Spirit. I really believe that. The only thing that can tame the flesh is not just more discipline. So I believe that self-control comes from the Holy Spirit because Galatians 5 lists it as one of the evidences of the Holy Spirit in a man's life, in a woman's life. Self-control is listed as one of the indicators that you have the Holy Spirit. And so it is the Spirit who does this. Now, this next couple of minutes, I'm going to share something with you that is even beyond a little bit of this, just because it's so important for the Christian life. And what I'm about to share with you may bring you into victory in a way that you've never experienced in your life. And the reason I say that is because someone shared with me the train diagram, and it changed my life when I was 19 years old. And so I'm going to share with you the train diagram. Here it is. Successful, excuse me, feelings are fine as long as they are not in charge. If feelings are in charge without rational thinking in the Holy Spirit, then the flesh wins and the circumstance wins as opposed to something else. I want you to see this. Successful faith, circle the word faith, and successful obedience, circle the word obedience. So faith and obedience are driven by truth or facts, not feelings. You see, if feelings are in charge, you're going to lose it. You're going to wipe out. It's not going to work. Feelings deceive you. Your heart deceives you. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all, above all else and desperately sick. Who can know it? And we, we often think of feelings as coming from the heart, and sometimes it's a combination of heart and mind, but we, we see this. Feelings can be very, very good, but they also can be quite a bit of trouble. We often, you know, go back to the 1970s, Andy Williams. Feelings, nothing more than feelings. I mean, do you remember that? Some of you, and some of you are ready to sing it with me. You know, feelings, I mean, it goes on and on and on, oh, feelings, you know, and, and, and you know, it's this, it, it's just all about the emotion of my heart breaking that I don't have you, and, and, and it's, you know, that some of those sentiments may be right, but you know, you cannot live in a successful relationship with God being driven by your feelings because He has given us facts. And he's given us a mind that is able to process truth, rationale. Our God is a logical God. Now, he's a feeling God. He's an emotional God. There's no doubt about it. But we always see that his emotion never contradicts his truth. And so we have to bring our emotion under submission to truth. And when we do that, now, our world doesn't understand this. Our world runs now on emotions and feelings. I mean, it all has to do with how does it feel. People don't say anymore, well, I think so much. Instead, what do we say? Well, I feel. We talked about that in our worldview study, that over the last hundred years, the world has moved much more to a feeling-based rationale than even a, or motivation, than a thinking rationale. Now, here's the picture. Um, And I I want you to kind of get this. The engine of the train diagram, the engine that drives the train is fact. 
And it's not just fact, but for the Christian, it's God's Word. And the fuel that goes into the engine is our faith. So we put our faith into something. It's not just not faith in faith. It's faith into the fact of God's Word. So we believe what His Word says. We trust what His Word says. We continue to learn what His Word says, and we continue to believe it. If God says He gives the strength to put up with this broken relationship or to have patience about this broken relationship, if God's love has been poured out within my heart through the Holy Spirit who's given to us, then, then I, can, I can forgive this person that has harmed me so much, or, you know, there's a multitude of applications of God's truth in our life, the things that seem so hard, but as we continue to study the fact of God's Word and put our faith into God's Word, then we can see. Now, some of you don't know what a locomotive is. Uh, We live in a day and time where we don't realize that there were steam-powered locomotives. You've only seen the big diesel electric locomotives. But back in the day, when locomotives began, it had a boiler, and you had to shovel the fuel out of what? The coal car. You see the coal car behind this thing? That coal car, that mound that's there, is a bunch of coal, and they would shovel the coal car into the furnace on the locomotive. So those guys, they were driving the locomotive by turning it on and all that kind of thing, but they were also shoveling coal, and the more that they would create steam, it would drive the pistons, and the power would come, but it wouldn't go anywhere if it didn't have fuel, and the fuel was the coal car. So, so for, in this example, we're looking at it, and it's fact, and, and what do you do? You take your faith, and you shovel it into, that's what that little arrow is, you, you, you put your faith into God's Word. And then at the end of the train, there was a car that all the documents went on. What was that called? What is that thing called? The caboose. So the freight, and all the stuff, and the crew for the train, they they would have access to the, the uh, caboose, and the caboose would have the documentation of who shipped what and everything else. There was a, the reason for that. And, and so the caboose would come trailing along at the end of the train. Now, I just want you to think about this. God has made it so that we can live our lives with fact, faith, and feeling, and the feelings properly in the back of the train. The feelings are powerful. Feelings are good. Feelings can bring either joy. They can let us know when things are wrong, and, you know, it's part of real of who we are. But we have been designed to keep the train moving forward. When we see Scripture, we see that we should keep the train in the forward direction. But do you know that some people run the train of their life in reverse? Now, think about that. What's... What, what's the picture here? Feelings are going first. Feelings are, are, are what's running the show. I mean, the, the picture is that they're just kind of going based upon what they feel. And, you know, well, this feels right today and it doesn't feel right tomorrow. And, you know, what about this? And this all feels like a disaster. There's no hope in this. Da, 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 da. Whereas God's people are called to say, no, I'm not going to live with the train in reverse. I'm going to keep the train going forward putting my faith in what God has said in His Word, and I know that eventually the feelings will come along beside, behind. So, the, the picture is a pastor can't just live his life based upon feelings. A pastor has to live his life based upon the fact of God's Word and putting faith in that, and he has to help people do the same thing. Um, and part of that is being self-controlled. It, part of it has to do with not just simply giving in to all of this wide variety of great struggle and trouble that may come up through feelings. Now, for some of you, I, I just want to encourage you to look at that train diagram and just think, you know, Lord, I don't want to put my faith in my feelings anymore. I want to put my faith in what your Word says, and I ask that your Word in, it will drive my life. And give me the grace to wait on the feelings to come. You know, rarely does it feel like the right thing to do. Usually, it does not feel like the right thing to do. When the the right thing does not feel like the right thing to do. Um, A lot of times, that has to be a decision that is a self-controlled decision. And then, eventually, you feel like it. That's very often the way it has been for me. Look at number four. 
Number four is to be upright. And these last three have to do, especially, these last three have to do with their leadership and the the effect of these characteristics on the congregation, but they still apply to every Christian. You see, a pastor, as we see in the list, hospitable, lover of good, self-controlled, and then upright. This is, has to do with being just, God's justice, just, and, and righteous. In fact, God, the very same word that is used here in Titus chapter 1 and verse 8 for upright is the same word that refers to God when it comes to do with His righteousness and impartiality in all things. Look at this in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. This reveals that God's justice saves us. This is part of the gospel. Look what it says right there. It says, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just. Circle the word just. He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is the gospel. So, Christians are called to live in this. You see, this is living and leading in accordance with God's law and justice, not in accordance to the things that are bent or crooked or warped or partial. No, that's that's not what we're supposed to lead in. That's not how a pastor should leave, it, 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 from a bent perspective or a crooked perspective or something that is warped. And all those have different nuances, by the way. Um, following God's standard when he's making judgments is the, go- is the goal, and that is what Christians are called to do. We say, I believe this, and I work through this because this is what God says and because this is what is right. So it's to be upright. Five, the word holy is not the usual word for holy throughout the New Testament. It's a slightly different word. Um, It has just a small nuance of difference that is very beautiful in how it points to this. Notice here with me, like God, He is morally set apart from the world. When we say that God is holy, what it's saying is, is that He is the creator and everything else is creation. He is different than the rest. God is not like the world. In fact, the world is fallen, and there's sin that is in the world, and God is not a sinner. God doesn't have anything to do with sin except saving his people from it. And so here we see that God is morally set apart from the world. The pastor, the Christian, needs to be morally set apart from the world. And so this one is living and leading as one who, like God, has different values and affections than the world, knowing that this world is passing away and that eternity is coming. Now, interesting that small nuance is here. You see, this, the idea here underneath number five is he is pious. The pastor is called to be pious, which means he is, fill it in, devout and distinct in both his being and his behavior. So who he is is devout, and who he is, is and, and what he does, is called to be um, devout and distinct, not like the world. So, this idea of piety, this idea, piety is not a bad thing. You know, we've made that an evil thing. Our society says, oh, look at that guy, he's so pious. Well, actually, pious is a good thing. Pious is set apart. I mean, we, we've said, oh, look at that. He's so righteous. That's a good thing. God is righteous. We're called to be righteous. Now, what people mean by that is very often they're inferring and they're, they're impugning that as saying you're judgmental and you're judgmental in a negative and ungodly way. Um, we have to be careful not to fall for the world's trap on this. We are called to piety. Your home should be different than the homes on your street. The things that are going on in your apartment should be different than the things going on in the apartments around you who do not know God. There should be some things that are not allowed in your apartment. They're not allowed into your home because you are a a God-centered home. There are things that should not be on the television and on the computer because, precisely because, you are pious and you are not like the world. So here we see that God has called us to be 
a holy people. And the last one that is listed in these that he must be is disciplined, is disciplined. And this is a very interesting word, and very briefly it says, he is mastered from within. Um, This has to do with his constitution, not saying that he himself is God or anything like that, but it has to do with that which is making the decisions is not coming from the world around him and his circumstances around him, how he feels or the pain that is there or the other things that are there, but he is making decisions based upon, and he's living his life based upon a internal system of values and an internal system of that which is right and wrong. You see, so fill this in, walking with God in the, fill this in, integrity of his heart is the issue, not due to external expectations. And so part of this idea of being mastered from within is that in his heart, he is seeking to be before God, not before man. You may want to write down a book. There's a book by um, Ed Welch that says, when man is big and God is small. That's a dangerous thing in your life for man to be big and for God to be small. What should it be? That God is big and man is small. When God is big in your life and man is small, you're not living your life seeking to please men. You're not living your life afraid of men, the people that are around you. Instead, walking with God in the integrity of his heart, not due to external expectations. You see, this often has to do with that traditional understanding of of discipline that has to do with denying the present moment. And you get this, denying the present moment for the sake of future glory. We have to be willing as Christians to deny the present moment, to deny the flesh, to deny the easy way out, to deny the, the, you know, just the response, whatever it may be, to deny the present moment for future glory. Now, you've already started packing up, I know, but just notice here, Luke 22, circle Luke 22. And I want you to see this as we finish. In Luke 22, on the night before he's going to the cross, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, creator of the universe in human form, left the upper room, went down, stepped across the Kidron Valley, the the Kidron River that was there, just a little brook, would have been bright red that night, by the way, because of the sacrifices. The blood coming out of the temple mount. He stepped across that, perhaps in the moonlight. It was already dark. And he went up into an area called Gethsemane, the Mount of Olives. And he went there, as was his custom at night, to spend time with God. And the disciples went with him that night. And there he, and I've been there, and many of these trees, some of these trees would have still been there um, from even when Jesus was there. Uh, Some of these olive trees are very, very old. But while I stood there a few years ago, I was just thinking about the prayers of Jesus, of denying the present moment for the future glory that he was about to go to the cross, and it wasn't just about to be a physical torture, but the greatest spiritual torture that could ever be that God, second person of the Trinity, who knew no sin would become our sin and take it to death on the cross, take it to the tomb and then rise again. There was about to be a conflict like nothing that we have ever seen or will ever see on the earth when the Son of God became sin for us. And the Bible tells us that he said, nevertheless, Father, you know, if there's any way for this cup to pass from me, let it pass from me, but nevertheless, not my will, but as thou wilt your will be done. 
This is the ultimate picture of discipline. This is the ultimate picture of denying the present moment for the future glory. And our Savior has done it. In the Bible, it says that he was so earnest in this prayer that his sweat became great drops of blood. I remember while I was standing there, I turned around and there's a wall that is there, and I noticed a very small carving in the wall. And this image has never left my mind as it just shows Jesus almost in total fluidity laid out before the Father in prayer because of his great agony. And in that moment, when Judas and the priests and the Roman guards showed up, he could have called a million angels to obliterate that hill and wipe out Jerusalem. And the creator of the universe did not do it. The creator of the universe allowed them to arrest him and mock him and torture him. And he willingly laid down his life for his friends. Friends, this is the gospel. I don't know if you have ever come to truly believe the gospel, but I call you, if you hear God's voice calling you to himself to believe this gospel, I call you to come and to believe this gospel and to see that Jesus died for the sins that we could never die for. Jesus died for the sins that we could never forgive. Jesus came and he gave his life as a ransom for many, and he did it through a massive discipline. And he calls us to learn to live in that kind of love and that kind of discipline. Would you pray with me?